All right. Uh, good evening, guys. I would like to welcome you all uh, for our first session uh, for uh, Economics uh, 1B, right? Uh, so Economics 1B, that is macroeconomics, right, for the first year students. And also uh, in line with Economics 1B, we'll also be doing fundamentals of macroeconomics. It's basically the same module. It's basically the same module. You don't need to be scared. It's the same module. It's just that you've got different uh, question papers or different assignments that you are going to receive. But basically, it's the same module, it's the same content that you're learning. Whether you're doing economics 1B or you're doing fundamentals of macroeconomics, it's basically the same module. So we are going to combine all of you guys into one class, and we're going to go through it together. So um, I haven't really finalized the dates, but it is most likely we'll be doing it every Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. Uh, so for today, it's going to be a free class. And on Wednesday, it's going to be another free class just to introduce you guys uh, to your uh, to your to your professor, uh, Mr. Fortune, who will be taking you through the, the, the economics lesson. So like I highlighted uh, last semester, I took you guys for economics 1A, which is basically theory and a lot of graphs. But for economics 1B, uh, you will notice that there will be a little bit of some calculations, but it will be more practical when we are talking about the economy at large. Well, we are talking about issues of inflation, unemployment, and et cetera. And uh, your, your, your tutor, uh, Professor Fortune, is one of my, uh, my dear friends. Uh, we've been together for a while at, at Varsity Unlimited Tutors. He usually takes this course and some accounting courses for me. Uh, he's very good. I'm sure you'll be in capable hands. Then me, I will just pop up maybe when we start doing exam revision. I might show up to uh, to relieve him here and there so that uh, he also has got time, you know, uh, for family and whatnot. But I'm sure you will enjoy uh, the classes with him. If there are any problems, I'll always be available. Uh, on WhatsApp, I will be attending some of the classes in the background, and uh, you can always uh, give me a call. Then the prices are the same, just like we did for financial reporting and analysis. Uh, it's uh, 800 rand uh, for the entire semester uh, for each module, and this includes the KCQs. This includes the KCQs. Remember what we said about the KCQs? If you need one-on-one -on -one for the KCQs, you can talk to me, but I'll also provide uh, your tutor with some of the questions so that you can also discuss them even in the, in the, even in the class setup so that you can go through them together mm -hmm. as, a, what, as a team. Right? So as usual, uh, after each lecture, we'll provide you some notes and we'll also provide you the, the recording uh, of the video. Then if you have got any questions, feel free to, 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 to talk to your professor. He will answer those questions uh, for you. I think uh, that's all for me. If there's anything after the class, you can just uh, send in the group. I will post the, the video and any notes that he would have uh, provided. Remember, uh, the first two classes are free classes. These are introduction classes. So you will just be you know, trying to show you guys how he does his tutoring and trying to show you guys what is important for macroeconomics before we actually officially start the, the main classes uh, with you guys. I hope you have a wonderful evening. Uh, Mr. Fortune, I think you have the class. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. James. Just to confirm, uh, am I audible? Yes, yes, you are. Sir. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, I welcome you, everyone, to Economics 1B. As has been reiterated by Mr. James, I am Mr. Fortune, and I'll be taking you for this particular course, um, uh, Economics 1B. So as has been highlighted and taken from some of the words that Mr. Uh, James was talking, it seems as if some of you already has a background of uh, generally the subject of economics, which is a good thing. And I believe that there are some of you that do not have a background at all in relation to any approach when it comes to the subject of economics. So today um, I'm going to try to introduce uh, or to familiarize to you uh, what you're going to be looking at in relation to Economics 1B and some of the differences that you're going to be noting from uh, those that we're doing microeconomics or better known as Economics 1A and uh, Economics 1B, which is macroeconomics. So uh, what you have on your screen there, that is the starting point that I usually start with when it comes to the approach of the subject of economics. And I'm sure for those that were doing Economics 1A, you have uh, come across this particular diagram and it just gives you a, a general understanding of what you're talking about when you're talking about 
and economy, because when you are studying the subject of economics, we are basically talking about an economy, an economy in particular, uh, um, uh, where from uh, a national perspective or from a global perspective, this is what the setup of an economy generally uh, looks like. All right. So uh, just to uh, highlight a bit on Economics 1B, before I look at the diagram that you want to look at, you would find out that uh, it is made up of uh, eight to nine uh, uh, major topics that you're going to be looking at, which are macro in nature. By macro in nature, I will highlight later on uh, what I mean by macro in nature, because it's, it's, it's particularly different from the microeconomics that we're dealing with. And we'll be trying to look at the broader view of an economy. So the main objective of this particular module is to give you an understanding of the broader view of an economy. And you would understand this in the way that you're going to be examined in your, uh, uh, in your final examination. You'd see the questions that they're, they're going to be asking you. They're not going to be asking you to define anything. They're not going to be asking you to uh, uh, maybe offload some of the uh, uh, terms that you'd have crammed during the course of the semester, but they would want to uh, assess you on your application ability in terms of the information that you have. So your ability to apply the information that you're going to be learning is very, very crucial when it comes to this particular module. So you'd see that uh, we are trying to uh, move away from just you craving uh, definitions and this and that, but giving you an understanding into the critical uh, issues when it comes to um, uh, when it comes to an economy. All right. So if at any point I become um, unaudible, please highlight so that I do not speak to myself. All right. So uh, just coming back now to the diagram that you see on your screen, we talked about the application uh, aspect, which we are going to start basically from this particular diagram. So basically an economy is a system of interdependent participants. I refer to them as participants which in their interaction form what we refer to as markets. So from a micro perspective, which is your microeconomics, you were learning on what was, what was referred to as the goods market. You were learning on also what was referred to as the factor market, where you were learning on demand and supply, where you were learning on a utility, when you, where you were learning on uh, market structures, perfect competition, monopoly, uh, et cetera, and also learning the basic economic structures in terms of uh, how a basic economic structure is made up of where you have your free market economy, which is basically an economy without the government where the uh, participants operate on their own. And these participants are responsible for the provision of the goods and services that are going to be uh, 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 provided within that particular economy, as well as the uh, demand side, which is the consumption of that particular economy. And also it goes on to uh, reiterate or to highlight uh, the effect on, in terms of the prices, the price mechanisms, how prices are going to be determined in that particular economy. So we're not going to be looking at all those individual aspects of an economy. We're going to be looking at them on a broader perspective. So you'd see when it comes to uh, economics 1B, which is your microeconomics, we are now looking at what we refer to as aggregate demand. We are no longer looking at individual demand where you are looking at uh, demand on a family level or in a household level or in a market level, but you are looking at demand or at a, um, uh, um, uh, a national level, where you're looking at elements like uh, the total demand within the economy, where we sum uh, all of the uh, 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 demands that will be within the various uh, industries, various um, uh, uh, sectors of the economy, uh, formulating what we're referring to as aggregate demand. And when you're looking at supply, we're also looking at what is referred to as aggregate supply. We are looking at the total production that is happening within a particular economy. So we are no longer just looking at uh, individual markets or individual market participants, but we are now looking at them at a broader perspective. And when it comes to the factor market, we are now looking at elements like uh, the level of employment within that particular uh, economy where you're trying to analyze the extent to which you're utilizing the resources available within the economy. We're going to be talking about the full employment, uh, talking about unemployment in particular, how it is calculated, and some of the effects that it creates within that particular economy. I also highlighted the effects of prices. We're now looking at the what we're referring to as uh, the general price level. We're no longer looking at the price of an individual product or an individual uh, uh, element. 
we are looking at what we are referring to as the general price level, which is uh, basically the price level of uh, all of the aggregated goods and services within that particular economy. And in that vein, we'll be looking at elements like inflation. What is it uh, when you're talking about inflation and the particular effects that uh, arise as a result of some of these elements? So I'm trying to um, um, uh, divorce you from thinking on a micro level so that we get the thinking at a macro level so that you'll be able to understand the particular elements. So with that, you also understand that um, uh, in terms of an economy, uh, an economy is made up of, we talked about the individual participants, the households, the firms, the government. This applies as well as to the macro element of uh, the subject of economics, because that also highlights uh, uh, certain elements when you're uh, looking at uh, what we are referring to as the types of economies. So you'd see that um, in your module, when you're going to be going through a module, we're going to be talking about, uh, talking about what we refer to as the uh, two-sector model, which is basically an economic system which is made up of only the firms and the households without the government. And uh, some of the assumptions that comes along as a result of that. And uh, uh, we'll be trying to analyze what is the effect of uh, a change in aggregate demand? What is it that causes that change in the aggregate demand? And who is it that is contributing to that particular level of aggregate demand within that particular economy? And if it is aggregate supply, we're also trying to look at uh, some of the contributory factors to what we are referring to as ag aggregate supply on a two-sector model. Then we're going to try to expand it into what we refer to as a three-sector model, where we are looking at an economy now which uh, has the firms and the households and also now including what we refer to as the government. We understand that the government is an important element when it comes to uh, any particular economy because these are the institutions that enable um, 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 the operations of, of any economy through the provision of regulation, et cetera, and elements like that. So they also um, contribute to such an economy by also creating an additional factor to aggregate demand. You're going to be looking at that and also how they influence aggregate supply in terms of their policies and uh, some of the policies that this particular government introduces in order to drive an economy towards a desirable level of either production or consumption, whatever it might be. So now I've been looking at what you refer to as the fiscal policy. So now you understand we're now trying to get deeper into uh, uh, Economics 1B. So I'm sure you've heard of the fiscal policy, you've heard of the government budget, that is where now it comes into being. You've heard of budget deficits, you've heard of uh, the, uh, the terms of uh, public debt, et cetera. This is where we are trying to be looking at some of the effects of some of these elements into the overall economy and for us to have an understanding uh, um, of how they contribute to the success or to the failure of a particular economy. Then also, we're also going to be looking at uh, the monetary side of the economy. So you'd see that um, as these participants that we've talked about interact with each other, they would need uh, some form of uh, uh, interaction vehicle, which we usually refer to as the financial sector. So for them to interact, because this is an economy, remember? So for them to interact, the only thing that makes sense in an economic uh, perspective when you're interacting is exchange of value for value. And for that exchange of value for value, it comes in form of, in nowadays, we're talking about uh, money. So we're going to be talking about the evolution of money, how money came into being, as well as some of the definitions that are used when it comes to uh, the subject of money as well as its effect on the on this particular economy that you're talking about. What is the effect of money uh, if it is to be increasing, if it supplies to increase in the, in the economy? How is it going to be affecting the general price level? How is it going to be affecting the cost of borrowing for, uh, for firms to produce? How is it going to be affecting consumption by households, as well as uh, obviously ultimately aff affecting the economy as a whole? How is it also going to be affecting employment as a whole within this particular economy? So that's where you see some of these uh, diagrams here where you see the firms and the households. Now we have in the middle there, the financial sector, uh, uh, highlighting the uh, uh, interaction or the intermediation that, that this particular sector um, uh, uh, does within this particular economy in order for these participants uh, to interact with each, with each other. So in terms of that, you would find out that uh, in terms of the financial sector, we'll be looking at various institutions that are important when it comes to um, uh, when it comes to the uh, 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 operation of this financial system, we'll be looking at the functions of the central bank. What is the central bank? Who is it that is behind the central bank? 
who is it that is uh, uh, making the policies that this particular central bank would be uh, enacting within a particular economy, as well as the importance of uh, these particular policies in terms of influencing a particular economy towards the desirable end. So I'm sure by now we are no longer strangers when it comes to the central bank in terms of the South African central bank, as well as uh, uh, um, uh, some of the individuals that are prominent within this particular uh, circle, where you would hear the increases in the repo rate. Why are they increasing the repo rate? Why are they uh, 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 um, uh, uh, enacting such particular policies when people are having uh, a different host of challenges within their livelihood? So these are some of the interpretations that we're going to be trying to make sense to you so that when some of these things come up, uh, when you miss some of these things, either in the news or in the different spheres where you are uh, um, uh, respectively uh, 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 influencing from, you would be able to be in a position to understand as well as to make sense of some of the uh, uh, policies that are being enacted in relation to that. So we're going to be looking at that when we'll be looking at the monetary sector, um, uh, et cetera. All right, so, so this is just a brief um, uh, highlight of some of the things that we're going to be looking at. It's not exhaustive, but it is there so that you can have an approach that is uh, on a macro uh, perspective. So I would want to move away from these particular um, uh, from these particular diagrams and try to get into uh, the economy itself. So I have highlighted the diagrams that uh, formulate what you refer to as an economy. But what you need to understand basically is what an economy is, as well as how that particular economy's performance is going to be measured. So I talked about the introduction of a government in a particular economy, uh, introducing the fiscal policy of a government. We've talked about the financial sector, the Central Bank of South Africa, these two institutions as well which uh, also introduce various policies into a particular economy. And when they introduce policies into a particular economy, how then are these policies going to be measured? How are we going to be knowing whether the, uh, uh, the, 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 the government is um, uh, introducing policies that work or policies that do not work, or whether the central bank is doing the right thing by increasing the repo rate or by decreasing the repo rate, et cetera. Uh, uh, we have what we refer to as the um, uh, measures to the performance of an economy. So an economy just by itself, as I have highlighted, this is a system of interdependence, which results in production, distribution, and consumption of goods and services within a particular economy. And the participants within this particular economy, as I have highlighted, do not change. We have the firms, we have the households, we have the government. And these participants, these four main participants are the ones that usually interact within a particular economy resulting in what we are referring to as an economy. So if you'd want to measure the performance of an economy, there are five basic measures that are given. Uh, you would see in your particular module, I'm sure this is the introductory uh, topic when it comes to uh, economics 1B, measuring the performance of an economy. So it is an introductory uh, uh, topic because that is the one that you're going to be using to interpret uh, the various policies that uh, would have been enacted by these uh, role players, as well as that is the one that you use again in order for you to prescribe the particular policies that are supposed to be used within a particular economy. So we're going to be looking at them one by one. So the first one is what we refer to as economic growth. So by definition, I'll just give a, a, a brief highlight on uh, economic growth then uh, uh, get onto the others, then get into uh, it uh, in a much deeper uh, detail. So by definition, economic growth simply refers to what is referred to as the increase in the gross domestic product over and above the previous financial period. So I'm referring to periods. So that means that this is a comparison that you are taking place uh, in terms of um, uh, uh, what we are referring to as gross domestic product. We're going to be looking at gross domestic product in um, in a short while and explain what this metric means and how it is calculated, as well as uh, um, uh, um, um, some of the uh, uh, limitations that this particular metric has. So basically that's what we use in, when it comes to the measuring of uh, economic growth. So when it comes to economic growth, we want to see an economy, whether it is growing or whether an economy is shrinking, because obviously if a particular um, uh, uh, a policy has been enacted, 
you'd want to see its effect in terms of the growth of the economy. So if the economy is growing, it means that but that particular policy is working. And if the economy is shrinking, it means that that particular policy uh, might be detrimental to the economy. And you find out that when it comes to economic growth, it affects a lot of variables at the same time. It affects um, uh, uh, the level of employment within the economy because if the economy is going to be shrinking. Uh, people are going to be losing out when it comes to jobs. People are going to be losing out when it comes to their income. And it's going to be uh, resulting in people getting into poverty and things like that and reducing the standards of living uh, within a particular economy. So you see that uh, with all these elements, they are interconnected. If one economy, one, one particular variable is not working properly, it also affects the next particular variable. And hence, as a result, that makes it delicate for us to be able to look at them one by one and have an, uh, a deeper understanding into them. Then um, the second measure is uh, full employment. So by full employment, we're trying to look at the extent of the utilization of the resources that we have within an economy. Uh, so we understand that um, some of the things that enables uh, an economy to operate are the resources that are available within a particular economy. So in terms of the resources, we're looking at the natural resources, we're looking at the factor and domains within that particular economy, and some of the resources get onto what we refer to as the labor and entrepreneurial uh, skills within a particular uh, economy. So if we're not fully utilizing these particular resources, it means that there is a challenge uh, within that particular economy because if you're not fully utilizing labor, it means that you're going to be having unemployment within the economy. You're going to be having people uh, that do not have any particular work within the economy and uh, that results in social ills and some of the uh, um, instances like that that you would see as a result of unemployment. Uh, the economy falling into poverty, the standards of living reducing, uh, and overall, you'd see that it has a negative impact on the economy. And you'd see that in terms of uh, the underutilization of other factors such as uh, natural resources, again, it also affects the economy in one way or the other because you are underutilizing what is available, which you could have been using in order for you to uh, uh, create employment and uh, emancipate the economy as a whole. So this is very, very important. So in terms of uh, full employment metric for this particular module, we are going to be looking at what we refer to as labor unemployment, la unemployment rate. So labor unemployment rate is of particular importance because it affects the lives of individuals uh, at a personal level um, and are trickling down to uh, the overall effect in terms of uh, the overall economy being affected at the same time where you'd see that people no longer have access to medication, people no longer have access to uh, 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 education, people no longer have access to a decent standards of living. And also, it also affects the level of aggregate demand as well within that particular economy, which is also important in driving economic growth. We're also going to be looking at how aggregate demand is a driver of economic growth uh, later on. Then we also have price stability. So if any particular economy is fully functional, or is functioning properly, it has to have what is referred to as price stability. So price stability uh, doesn't mean that we are basically talking about prices remaining the same, but uh, uh, um, we are talking about prices being stable. So we find out that uh, uh, in one, uh, from one point to the other or from one time period to the other, prices do change, prices do have an, uh, 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 a considerable change from one period to the other. But when you're talking about price stability, you're talking about the overall stability when it comes to the certain targets that would have been given by the central bank. There's what they refer to as the inflation rate targets, which are then used to assess whether the prices are stable. So you see that if prices then are to fluctuate beyond that particular target, it then becomes what we're referring to as inflation, which is uh, um, uh, detrimental when it comes to the economy. So when it comes to price stability, we are mostly interested in the metric that we call uh, the consumer price index. So I know there's the producer price index, of course it's important, but the consumer price index is very, very important because it uh, creates what uh, um, um, we refer to as the increase in the cost of living. So the consumer price index, we're going to be looking at what the consumer price index is and how it is used to measure um, um, uh, 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 this particular uh, inflation, and also understanding the uh, overall effect that it has when it comes to the cost of living of individuals, how when the prices are increasing, the uh, uh, the value of money erodes, and uh, uh, eventually that creates um, 
uh, a situation where people are uh, in a negative uh, uh, situation overly and that would affect the economy as a whole. So we're going to be looking at inflation, the types of inflation, as well as the detrimental effects that it has and some of the policies that uh, we are expected to be prescribing in, in, uh, in a scenario where we are having inflation. So for instance, just bringing it to the today's uh, scenario, we have been experiencing inflation uh, post 2020, yeah, post 2020 considerably, uh, especially after the uh, COVID-19 fallout, where you would see that uh, the inflation rate of prices has been increasing and um, uh, uh, the inflation rate prices has been increasing and um, uh, the prices of uh, notably fuel and um, uh, the cost of living in terms of the prices of bread, if you are to compare those from the previous uh, uh, periods, you'd see that there was a considerable change when it comes to that. So that is some of the contributory effects to what we are referring to as inflation, because when the prices are increasing, it results in the deterioration of the people's incomes and inflation overall is, is, is taking place. And in relation to that, we've been seeing the central bank, which is the South African Reserve Bank, prescribing repo rate increases, where you would see that there was an increase in the repo rate uh, uh, as a result of that. So we'd want to make sense of that. Why are they increasing the repo rate when prices are increasing? Because if you're going to be increasing the repo rate, people's uh, um, uh, 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 incomes are going to be eroded, especially those that uh, have a lot of borrowing in them and people are going to be reducing uh, consumption, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we're going to be making sense of some of these policies and why they are going to be enacted when you'll be looking at these particular uh, uh, elements there. Then we have what we refer to as the balance of payment stability or external stability. So with external stability, we're looking at uh, the uh, uh, interaction of the local economy with the international economy. We understand that no economy operates in a vacuum. We have to import some of the goods from other countries, from China, from uh, Germany, from Japan. And also we need to be exporting some of the goods and services that we are producing locally to other countries. We need to export the wine that we're producing in Cape Town. We need to produce uh, some of the artifacts that we produce locally to other countries as well, in order for us to remain competitive when it comes to that. Uh, we'll be looking at some of the elements like the exchange rates, the effects on the exchange rates. If mm -hmm. we're going to be having instability within the local economy, how that is going to be affecting uh, the exchange rate as well. So it is, you, you've been seeing recently, the value of the rand has been deteriorating against the United States dollar. Uh, now the rand against the US dollar is something like uh, one US dollar is 20 rand somewhere there. If you look previously in previous periods around 2010, it was different. We're having maybe one rand equating to 10 rand, equating to um, uh, a dollar, 10 rand equating to a dollar. So you'd find out that uh, such scenarios again, create instabilities in some instances because you'd find out that it becomes expensive for you to import goods and services from other countries. And some of the goods and services are uh, essential within the economy. So I'm talking about this in a theoretical manner so that we have an understanding of uh, the reasoning that you're going to be expected to be um, uh, 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 applying when it comes to the subject of economics. Then last but not least is the equitable distribution of income and wealth. So if the economy is growing, if the prices are stable, there's full employment, uh, what also is important is for us to consider whether that particular growth is, um, um, uh, is inclusive. Is it including everyone or is it including only a certain portion within the economy? And in terms of this one, uh, in South Africa per se, uh, South Africa is regarded to be the one of the most unequal economies in the world. Uh, with what they refer to as the Gini coefficient of 0 0.67, which is regarded to be the most unequal when it comes to the interpretation of that coefficient. We're going to be looking at that one later on when you look at uh, the uh, 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 development, et cetera, as well as trying to interpret whether uh, the economy would be um, developmental when it is only growing from a gross domestic uh, product pers perspective but not including uh, the individuals within that particular economy as well. So you find out that this is very, very important because this creates unst un instability within an economy. And as a result, that creates a scenario whereby uh, you'd eventually have um, uh, scenarios where you'd be having social unrest, uh, uh, um, uh, elements like uh, what we experienced in the July unrest where people were simply hungry and wanted to 
just get a piece of uh, uh, something to eat and ended up looting the 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 the, the, the um uh, ended up looting the um uh, the stores. So those are some of the elements that we're going to be looking at. So just uh, uh, so that we understand where we are. So we talked about uh, economic growth, and we say that economic growth is the increase in the gross domestic product from one period to the other. So we just want to look at uh, the element of economic growth, and uh, so that we understand um, uh, why it is important within a particular economy. So we're going to be looking at what uh, gross domestic product is and why it is considered an important indicator of uh, the growth of any uh, eco economy, as well as uh, looking at what uh, the difference between what we refer to as nominal GDP and uh, uh, real GDP, as well as looking at um, uh, um, uh, whether gross domestic product increases would necessarily mean that the economy is growing. So we're also going to be looking at some of those uh, elements. So we want to look at defining gross domestic product. Let me just make my font a little bit larger there so that uh, it becomes a little bit visible for everyone. All right. So as I have highlighted that uh, gross domestic product uh, basically refers to the increase in the um, uh, um, uh, value of the production within a particular economy. So when you're talking about gross domestic product, we're looking at the value of the production that is happening within the particular economy, as well as um, uh, how it is going to be measured. So just allow me to come back there. All right, so we want to define what gross domestic product. So this is very, very important because the definition also is important when it comes to what we look at at uh, gross domestic product and what we do not look at when it comes to defining gross domestic product because I've seen in past exam papers, they can give you a range of uh, uh, statistics in terms of uh, values and um, uh, 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 various uh, indices that you're supposed to be using to calculate this gross domestic product. So if you're given a range of uh, information without knowing what is to be included in gross domestic product, you would end up including what is not supposed to be included in gross domestic product because you do not have an understanding of the definition of gross domestic product. So the understanding of the definition is important. So as I violated that, you are not likely going to find at any point uh, being asked to uh, uh, define what gross domestic product is in your final OSA, but the application aspect of that definition is very, very important. So now let's look at the definition of gross domestic product. So gross domestic product, sometimes referred to as GDP, is the monetary value of all the final goods and services produced within uh, the boundaries of a country at a given time period uh, 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 within a particular nation. So we want to look at the first element, which is the total monetary value. So it is expressed in monetary, in monetary terms. So you'd find out that it is if it is in South Africa, it would be expressed in rand terms. And... Uh, the, the, the clarification when it comes to what uh, they would have considered for uh, for them to look at the value terms in terms of the rand, we're going to be looking at it when we're looking at uh, the methods that are, that are used to measure uh, gross domestic product. So first of all, it is the total, total monetary value of all the final goods and services. So this is important again, because uh, you'd find out that in some instances, you might be given intermediate goods when it comes to uh, 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 measuring gross domestic product. And if you include the intermediate goods and the final goods, you'd have, what we, you'd have done what we refer to as double counting, which is an error uh, prone to the uh, calculation of these GDP statistics. And hence, as a result, you find out that uh, overly that might end up uh, affecting the um, um, mark that you're going to be getting in your final uh, exam. Then also the other important aspect is that this particular metric, it is calculated within the geographical boundaries of that particular country. So when you're looking at uh, the uh, geographical boundaries of a particular country, you're now looking at uh, the limitations in terms of the extent to which you are going to be looking at in terms of um, 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 uh, uh, the, the calculation statistics that you're going to be using. So basically, you're looking at, uh, if it is in South Africa, you're looking at uh, the value of all the goods and services that would have been produced in South Africa. So you find out that there are variations to this gross domestic product with gross national product, which is different from gross domestic product, which you're going to be looking at uh, later on, which you're going to be unpacking again later on. And uh, the differences in these 
uh, elements is important. So this definition by itself, if you understand this particular definition, you are able to answer any topic, uh, any question, sorry, when it comes to the calculation of gross domestic product, because you know what to include and you know what not to include. So this particular definition of gross domestic product, it includes the production of all the final goods and services uh, within the boundaries of a country, irregardless of who produced it, whether it's a foreign national that produced it, whether it's a foreign um, uh, 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 international organization that is producing within the boundaries of South Africa, it is included within gross domestic product. So you find out that there's a variation again when you look at what you refer to as gross national product. Gross national product does not include uh, 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 production by uh, uh, foreign entities, foreign uh, individuals. It only includes uh, the production only by um, uh, the citizens of a country, regardless of their uh, uh, place of residence, whether someone is in the United States, whether they are in China, as long as they are producing something, we include it in what we refer to as gross national product, but not in GDP. So that is very, 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 very important. All right. So we just want to get to um, um, understanding how the gross domestic product is then used to calculate economic growth. So that is the main uh, aspect that you're going to be looking at. So what you have on your screen there, um, the uh, Sub-Saharan Africa gross domestic product growth forecast, um, um, I think in the year 2012. So we're just using them for uh, academic purposes so that we have an understanding uh, of uh, what you're uh, talking about there. And you have in terms of, this is in terms of the growth. This is the growth perspective. And we have the growth perspective and we have the um, GDP, what they are referring to as the GDP per capita. We're going to be highlighting again what GDP per capita is after uh, understanding the calculation of the gross domestic product. Uh, growth rate. So for us to calculate the gross domestic product growth rate, we use this particular formula, which states that GDP of the current period minus the gross domestic product of the previous period divided by the gross domestic product of the pre previous period times 100. So it have been given an array of gross domestic products over uh, a range of periods. So you are supposed to simply calculate the current gross domestic product uh, minus the previous gross domestic product divided by the previous gross domestic product times the 100. For example, if you're given uh, GDP statistics for a particular country uh, in 2023, and you are given uh, that the gross domestic product was 15 trillion, and in 2022, the gross domestic product was 14 trillion. So this is just for academic purposes. This is a hypothetical example uh, for us to understand this particular um, uh, 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 formula. So for us to calculate gross domestic product growth rate, we simply say 15, which is the current period, 2023 period, minus 14 trillion, which is the 2022 gross domestic period, divided by the 2022 uh, gross domestic product period uh, uh, GDP, which is 14 trillion, times 100. So 15 minus 14 divided by 14 times 100 gives you 1 over 14 times 100 in percentage terms, that gives you 7.14%. So that is how you calculate gross domestic product growth rate. So I've seen uh, particular exam scenarios where you are given various gross domestic product statistics and you are required to calculate the value of gross domestic uh, product growth rate or the economic growth rate to put it uh, uh, um, in, in, in clearer terms. So this is how you go about it. You simply calculate the current levels uh, gross domestic product minus the previous level gross domestic product divided by the previous levels gross domestic product. Then you multiply that by 100 for you to get the percentage when it comes to the growth, economic growth uh, uh, perspective. So these are some of the simplest that you would find. Uh, so in, in, within your exam, if you find an economic growth uh, uh, question, which requires you to calculate economic growth, uh, this is how you go about it. And you would know that uh, um, uh, 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 you, you, you have those marks in your pocket. So we want to look at some of the metrics or some of the variations when it comes to gross domestic product. Uh, sometimes you'd find out that gross domestic product is given in what they refer to as per capita terms. So when you're looking at per capita terms, they are now looking at the gross domestic product 
divided by the population within that particular uh, uh, within that particular nation. So we understand that in South Africa, uh, we have approximately something like 60 million uh, uh, when it comes to uh, the individuals that are, uh, are within South Africa. And when it comes to the gross domestic product um, in United, United States dollar terms, it's around, let's just say 500 billion, 500 billion US. So this is in United States dollar terms. You'd find out that in some instances it is given in United States dollar terms, and you're going to be talking about it in foreign terms, in foreign currency terms, more often than not. So you are, you you basically have to be acclimatized to using some of these uh, elements. So say the South African um, 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 growth rate, uh, or rather South African uh, GDP, is 500 billion, and the population is 60 um, 60 million calculate the GDP per capita. So 500 billion divided by 60 million in mathematical terms, I think for us to be able to put it across, it would be something like this, 500 divided by 60 million. So that means that on average, we are basically saying that each particular individual within the South African economy would have access to that amount of money that you're gonna be calculating in, in United States dollar terms uh, um, uh, 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 yeah. So that means that we're basically saying that is the average income rate within that particular economy. So if you are to divide that in United States dollar terms, let me just try to do that very fast. It gives you something like uh, United States dollar 8,333. So that is 8,333. And in RAND terms, if you multiply that by 20, which is the current um, uh, exchange rate, so we're basically saying that 8,333 times 20, which is, uh, we're basically saying 20 rand is equal to one dollar. We're basically saying that one, one individual in South Africa is having on average, uh, that gives you 166,000 rand, is having an income, a per year income of 166,000 rand, 660. Uh, this is on the assumption that all things are equal in terms of uh, the distribution of income within that particular economy. So you'd see that when you're looking at GDP per capita, we're now looking at the distribution of a gain of income within the particular economy, as well as uh, the developmental aspect of individuals within that particular economy. And it also assumes that everyone is getting an equal portion of gross domestic product within that particular economy. So you'd see that the per, per capita GDP is also used as some of the terms that are going to be used when it comes to uh, uh, some of the uh, examinable questions they'll be using the per capita terms, they can use the gross domestic terms in its entirety. So you need to understand the differences between the two and to appreciate uh, uh, some of the assumptions that are behind these per capita calculations, etc. And so that you, 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 you get a rough understanding. So basically, if we are to look at it, is everyone getting 166,000 uh, per year in South Africa. Uh, that's something that uh, we need to have a debate on uh, some other time. So this is just on a theoretical perspective that, that's what we're looking at. So we just want to look at uh, in closing, I think our time is running out, uh, in terms of how we measure Sorry, this no. to Mr. Project. Sorry, okay, I'm hearing someone. Sorry, sir. Yes. Can you please repeat, can you please repeat the first one? How do you divide by 14? All right, let's get to 14. All right, let's come back here. All right, so somebody wants us to look at uh, the gross domestic product uh, growth rate calculation. So let me just have a recap on that one. Okay, I think because of our time, let's just close it uh, after this because the time I think is, uh, is, is running towards the negative. So I had some of uh, load shedding. So just to incorporate it, co incorporate them as well. Let's just have a look at this one, and uh, we're going we're gonna to close at this particular uh, point. All right. So we're talking about gross domestic uh, growth rate, and we say that the formula that we use when it comes to gross domestic uh, product growth rate or economic growth rate is uh, the current year's GDP minus the previous year's GDP divided by the previous year's GDP times 100. So this is the basic formula that you use to calculate any growth rate uh, of any uh, uh, um, uh, a metric, even if it is not gross domestic, gross domestic product. So you just basically take the current years 
period uh, uh, calculation minus the previous year's period calculation divided by the uh, previous year's period and multiply it by 100. So suppose we have an example here, which says that given the GDP of a country and in 2023, we have 15 trillion as the current year's gross domestic product. And you're also given that in 2022, the gross domestic product was uh, uh, 14 trillion. So we have two different figures that we have. We have one for 2023, which is 15 trillion. So the 2023 one, let me rewrite it. 2023 GDP is equal to what? 15 trillion, which I'll just say 15 T there. Then with the 2022 gross domestic product um, uh, calculation, uh, which is 14 trillion, which I'll just say 14 T. And we are required to calculate the economic growth rate. So for us to calculate the economic growth rate, we know we have the formula which says the current year's gross domestic product minus the previous year's uh, 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 gross domestic product divided by the previous year's gross domestic product and we multiply that by 100. So for us to do that, we're simply going to be saying 15 trillion minus 14 trillion. Uh, then we put that in brackets. Then we observe the mathematical rules for that uh, a particular uh, calculation. Then we divide it by 14 trillion. Then we simply multiply it by, by 100. Then on that one, if you do that particular calculation, let me just redo it to see if I uh, calculated correctly. So I'm simply saying 15 minus 14, which gives you one divided by 14, which gives you uh, 0 0.0714 and to two decimal places. And if you multiply that by 100, it gives you 7.14%, which is the figure that we have there. All right, so this is how you calculate uh, gross domestic uh, uh, product growth rate or the economic growth rate, put it per se, because this is what is used to calculate economic growth rate. So when they are saying that an economy is growing, this is how they would have calculated it. If they are saying that the economy is shrinking, this is how they would have calculated it. So you'd find out that in some instances, they try to divide that particular uh, growth rate, that particular GDP, uh, into quarters where they say that in the first quarter, maybe the first three months of the particular year, the gross domestic product amounted to such and such uh, uh, an amount. And uh, the second quarter, it amounted to such an, uh, such an amount. And they simply use these uh, current year's period minus previous year's period divided by the previous year's period times 100 for you to see if there's a growth rate or there is a negative growth within that particular quarter, uh, uh, put it per se. All right, are we together there? All right, I think let me just allow this time to entertain any questions because the time is running out. Uh, we'll not be able to finish on the uh, measures that we have uh, in terms of uh, uh, gross domestic product. So if you have any questions on what I've presented or what we're going to be looking at later on, uh, I'm giving you the floor now. I think maybe for five minutes, we'll be uh, looking at the questions if there are any um good evening yeah. yes. if i may just ask you just uh -huh. for sake what is actually the gross uh, what's the gdp what are those products if i may just ask all right so let's get back to the definition the definition will give us uh, uh the the answer what are the products that are included in gross domestic product so the definition here is saying that gross domestic product is the total value of all the final goods and services produced within the boundaries of a country. All right. So I want to highlight something there. We're going to be looking at some of the weaknesses of this gross domestic product metric. So we are looking at the goods. We are looking at the services. So we understand that an economy produces goods and it also produces services in form of financial services. Uh, various services that are produced in insurance services, et cetera, uh, in a nutshell. So all of these can be summed up in a monetary value uh, perspective, which would then uh, calculate as gross domestic product. So these goods are all any good that you're thinking of that is produced in South Africa within the formal market, okay? So 
That's number one. It is within the formal market. So gross domestic product does not include the informal market, what is being produced in the backyard of someone, when someone is producing, uh, um, uh, maybe someone is producing um, uh, meds per se, crafts, uh, et cetera, which are not included within the formal uh, uh, um, uh, production system or within the formal registration of a business, et cetera, you would find that those are not included within the um, uh, gross domestic product part. When you're saying the all part, we are basically talking about the formal part, the formal part of an economy. That is what you're referring to as the all of the final goods, whether it's bread, whether it's cheese, whether it's milk, whether it's uh, plastic that is being produced, whether it's gold that is being produced, whether there are diamonds that are being produced, whatever that you can think of, whether it's grapes that are being produced, or wine that are being produced in Cape Town, whatever it is, whether it's agricultural, industrial, technological, any good that you think of, as long as it is within the formal market that can be uh, 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 traced when it comes to the um, uh, 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 production, that is the goods that, are, that we are referring to. All right. I don't know if you have right, answered. Thank you. All right. So again, just to highlight there, it does not include elements like drugs. Of course, we understand that these are um, uh, illegal. You find out that it does not include illegal uh, substances like drugs, it does not include uh, substances which are not within the formal market system. Uh, we talked about subsistence. Uh, some are into subsistence farming. We, they produce goods and services that they only consume for themselves and maybe uh, will not eventually be recorded as part of the statistics because there are no records when it comes to that. It is not included when it comes to gross domestic product. So you'd find out that states SA, uh, these are the ones that usually measure these particular statistics, states SA, as well as the central bank, South African central bank, are also uh, some of the uh, contributors when it comes to the measuring of these uh, statistics. So where they derive their uh, statistics from usually is usually from the formal markets and does not include the informal markets. All right, anyone else with a particular question? Bread is a final product, yes. It just, Can we uh, be defined? Uh, All right, sorry, let me just look at a question here in the uh, chat. Someone is saying, uh, can wheat be defined as a final goods? As this is usually the first product before uh, being made into other products. So there are products that are used in the intermediate process of other goods. Those particular products are not categorized as the final product. But if wheat is consumed as the final product at any one point in time, um, uh, it can be the final product. So you just need to understand where it is coming into. But when it comes to the production of bread, obviously wheat is an intermediate. It is not the final, it is an intermediate. So we look at the value of bread, we do not look at the value of wheat. All right. Someone wanted to ask a question there. You can go ahead. Uh, someone wanted to ask a question or anyone with a question or maybe I've answered the question that they wanted to present. Mm, Kevin just um, dropped a message. So please just have a look at your message. There's a question there. All right. All right, define consume. Does it mean specifically eaten? All right. So when you're talking about consumption, okay. <laughs> okay, I, I like this particular question. I like it because it shows the person is thinking deeply. So this is the level of thinking that we want when it comes to economics. When you're talking about consumption, are we only referring to eating or are we only referring to consumption? Because we find out that uh, consumption, uh, there are certain goods like clothing where eating is not really uh, uh, included there, but it's, it's consumption as well. There are certain uh, products like, for instance, motor vehicles. Motor vehicles, if a motor vehicle is produced, uh, is, is, is the, 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 the use of a motor vehicle consumption when it comes to eating. So just to come to that, consumption is not necessarily meaning uh, eating when it comes to 
uh, opening our mouth, uh, chewing and uh, digesting and um, having a gastro uh, um, a gastroeconomic jubilee, whatever it might be. Uh, but it's it, it simply it simply means the use of something. That's what we are referring to as consumption. It's the use of something. If you're using something, you're consuming something. Uh, if you're using uh, uh, DSTV, if you're using the internet, you are consuming the internet. All right. I hope I've answered that one in particular. Yes. Consumption is using, yes. Fuel consumption, yes. Anyone else with a different question? Or if you want me to further highlight on that one, the floor is still open. For me, it's not a question as such, but uh -huh. thank you for the, for the, you know, for elaborating. Now I can listen to Kaya FM biz because okay. these are the terms that they normally talk about. And I find myself not understanding like yeah. Um, yeah. GDP per capita and all of those uh -huh. things. But no, thank you very much. All right, welcome. That is the purpose of uh, you taking this particular module. And I believe at the end of it, you are going to be a master of these things and uh, I believe uh, some of you are going to take this course uh, to different dimensions until you become the people who will be um, enacting these policies, etc., within the economy. All right. So we're going to be looking so at all can, of these. Can, oh, yes, right. yes. Go on, go on, go on. No, what, what I wanted to know is, so what you're telling me about the the the, the so any product that needs to be combined with another product, it, uh -huh. it doesn't... It, it doesn't fall under the GDP. For example, like Kevin was asking, somebody was asking about the wheat. Uh -huh. So I wanted to, things like um, there's somebody growing hops on their, on their, on, 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 on top of their roof and uh -huh. then selling it to, to, to the brewery to make alcohol. Uh -huh. So does that, it does that form part of the GDP or, or, or what happens because it's not a finished product. All right. So uh, what we look at when you are trying to calculate the value of uh, gross domestic product is the end product. Because if you're going to be calculating the value of wheat and say it's a uh, gross domestic product, then calculate the value of bread and say it's gross domestic product, we would have done an error which is called double counting. So by double counting, you're basically saying that we've counted something twice, uh, which is being uh, uh, included in the calculation of something else. So for instance, uh, let's just use the example of bread here. Bread uses wheat. It uses, uh, what else is used in the uh, forming of bread? I know mainly wheat, so I'll just use wheat. So when you are making bread, we are not going to go back to the wheat, the value of the wheat, and say maybe the for us to have um, um, uh, the total amount of loaves that has been produced in South Africa, let's say 750,000 loaves, et cetera, or even 1 million loaves, I don't know. Uh, we are not going to go back again and look at how much wheat was used and the value of that particular wheat. Because if you do that and we add again the value of the bread, we are doing what you are referring to as double counting. We are counting uh, the, that value twice because it is already included in the value of that bread because the bread is a value addition of wheat. We've added value to the wheat until it became bread. So you cannot include uh, wheat again in terms of the calculation of bread because it's double counting. And when it comes to someone who's bro uh, growing uh, and selling it to the brewery, uh, we look at the value of what the brewery is going to be producing and not at the value of that, what that particular individual is, 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 is uh, uh, contributed to the brewery because it is inclusive in what the brewery is going to be producing at the end of the day. All right, unless if it is going to be consumed directly without uh, any value addition. As long as there's no longer any value addition, we're going to be using it as part of GDP. Oh, so if the person is like, let's say maybe splitting it, some, some of it is going to be um, eaten directly, the other one is going to be sold. The one yes. that we enter the GDP is the one that will be sold directly to somebody um, for direct consumption. Yes, those two are different. The other one is already a final product. The other one is an intermediate product in the production of another good. So as long as if it is an intermediate product, the value that has been intermediated or that is going to be value added for us to have the final product is not going to be part of uh, GDP. We're going to be looking at the final product. And the one that is being consumed directly 
uh, uh, maybe through sales to individuals that are going to be using it straight without any value addition, that is going to be forming part of GDP. But if it is uh, going to be value added at any uh, process in the uh, production process, it's not going to be part of uh, GDP. We look at the final product. Thank you. Finally makes sense. Hey, now oh. I can now I know when they say hey, the GDP of the country is hey, now I know oh. I'm talking about in radio. Hey. Good, 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 good. All right. Uh I don't know if you have any further questions. It seems like we've run out of time. Um thank you very much for attending uh today's session. We're going to be having another session again on Wednesday, as it as has been highlighted. And I look forward uh, to seeing all of you again as we delve much deeper into this particular interesting subject. As uh, we all see and we all understand that this particular subject affects us in one way or the other. So they say that ignorance is no defense. So if you understand economics, or if you don't understand economics, you're going to be affected equally with some of these things. And uh, we need to have an understanding of all of these things for us to um, uh, find, uh, if, if eventually have uh, 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 um, the right application when it comes to some of these things. All right, thank you very much. Until we meet again, goodbye.